Awesome. That means we just weeded them out. <laughs> yeah, the discussion the other day was just too much for them to continue. <laughs> Is anyone planning on taking the exam next Thursday? Or are you going to submit the questions into, into me by the Monday that follows vacation? The 18th, yes. Questions. The 18th. Questions. Right? Okay, that's the plan? That's my plan. Yeah, first. So there's be no class next Thursday. Woo. Obviously, you will submit the answers to the questions, and you'll submit them by? The 18th. The 18th, midnight on the 18th. Okay. Okay? Sounds good. Anything else? So we're all good? Yes. Yeah. And all the questions are posted, so it's just up to the week as we, well, be, I can say, we'll tell you right now, we threw section uh, eight, all right, because we're on section right seven right now, we'll finish this, and there's not a lot that much tonight, and then section eight, we will do all of section eight on Tuesday when we meet again. Okay? Sounds good. Any questions? Well, then let's talk about uh, the balance of section seven. And we were talking about uh, 93A and 176D, insurance practices, settlements, and the like. And that's really what these cases deal with today uh, are, are these insurance issues. And under the terms of your insurance policy, or under various term, terms of the uh, various insurance policies, there are obligations that the company has to work with their insured and try to settle it on their behalf. And, um, it really regulates uh, the activities that the insurance company owes to uh, its insured. Um, you know, I was, I think I, I've told some of you this story, I was sued in Rhode Island for the acts of one of my children in driving my car. Um, and um, the woman who hit my car was 93 years old. Uh, Ultimately, it ran up a lot of medical bills, um, and then at some point, as 93-year-olds tend to do, dies. Um, but the suit was filed, and um, the evidence appeared to indicate, not to appear, indicated she ran the red light because she was late for church. Um, and the uh, suit, nonetheless, survived and went to trial. Um, I have a, an insurance policy, not, so not that you'll jump out in front of my car someday going down Federal Street, but I, <laughs> I have an insurance policy that carries with it about a half a million dollars in limits in case someone gets hurt, in case someone hurts me. Um, to me, as far as I was concerned, they should offer, and, and even though it's a no liability case in my opinion, they should offer her whatever it takes up to $500,000 to get rid of the case, right? Because what that means is it doesn't cost me a dime, doesn't involve my personal assets or my house or anything like that. But it affects your insurance. I could care less. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't know, really, right? At the end of the day, um, we're, not, we're talking about all the everything else that you have, so I don't care. Um, and uh, we had to work hard, I had to work hard, to uh, get them to agree that if they chose to try the case, as they ultimately did, and as they were doing, because they never offered more than, and the woman had, my recollection is she had close to 60 grand in medical bills alone. Now she didn't have probably much lost earning power, um, but she had 60 grand in specials alone. They never offered more than maybe five to $6,000 to settle the whole case. So there's no way anyone's gonna settle a case for five to 6,000 where they already Oh, 60 grand. Um, and what I try to impose upon them is the desire to uh, make it worth their while not to try it. Because obviously you try a case, there are risks even where you don't think there's liability. Uh, at the end of the day, by my constant uh, emails and threats, uh, what they agreed to do is that they would indemnify me for any losses that would exceed the policy limits. Um, in essence that they would pay. And so if they're risking their own dime, then great. But if they're simply not offering $150,000 because they uh, feel, what do we got to lose? That's the most they'll come in at trial. 
but it's not really the most because the most for a death case could be significantly more than that. Even in cases where the clients come in and they have insurance policies and it is an auto accident case like this. And so in addition to, to, to um, settling the case once liability becomes reasonably clear, they have an obligation to provide defense for that claim. But there's a real tension there between who does that lawyer represent. Does that lawyer represent the insurance company who, who are paying their fees on a regular basis, or do they represent the insured who I never even met that lawyer ever, uh, ever. And so he doesn't know me from anywhere other than the emails we exchange. Um, and the fact is the insurance company sends them a lot more business and will continue to send them a lot more business than I ever will. And so I know you probably read your ethics and you understand that you know you have to work regardless of you take your orders from the client not the person paying your bills mm -hmm. yuck 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 okay um, but that is the ethical conundrum here um, and so I think in a lot of cases it is very important especially if it looks like the lot or even appears that liability might exceed policy limits that there is still a room for you to represent your client and to make sure the insurance company rep does what it's supposed to do appropriately. Uh, and what that means is to try and force them to settle within policy limits because that doesn't cost your client anything. Um, and, and you've got to recognize that because I think sometimes we say, well, you, oh, they'll, they'll provide a lawyer and they'll provide a settlement up to whatever the amount is. But there's a real incentive for the insurance company not to, um, to save money on their policy. Uh, my brother just had a case up in Maine over the, uh, within the last two weeks. Um, the, I think the highest number they ever, well, I'm not even sure I'm supposed to talk about that. Um, policy limit was a million dollars. And what the, uh, the first policy, there are other policies, but the first policy was a million dollars. And what the lawyer for the defendant was saying, he, he wants to save something off that. It's a good size case. He wants to save something off his million dollars. Because otherwise, if I'm going to pay the million, I'll pay the million. What, the, what do I care? So if you, if you say, you say your number is 999, what do I got to lose? I'll take, I'll take the risk of a no liability verdict or much lower than 999. So you got to make it worth my while to settle as well. Um, but what happens, as it turned out, is uh, they never offered enough to make it go away, so the case and, uh, is tried, uh, and the verdict comes in at a million and a half. Now, in the event there weren't other policies here, then that half a million dollars now rests with the defendant, and in, truly his insurance carrier didn't likely serve his interest, because 950, I'll almost guarantee you, would have made that case go away. So they didn't ever offer it anything close because they were looking to save some off the policy. That is the way they often work. That's where you guys come in to try and make sure under 176D that they do the right thing by your client. And 176D tells you what some of those right things are. Like in Timpson, if you remember Timpson, and it's hard to talk about the right thing with Timpson, but they didn't even provide him counsel under the policy a lot of times what the carriers will do is they will provide the representation under what we call a reservation of rights. Okay, we will represent you, but we're not agreeing to be bound by any judgment until the facts further come out to determine what it was that took place. Because think about that, if any of us had to hire a lawyer, Timpson paid 87 grand. He's lucky he's a professional football player and he has access to funds like that. Now, I'm not, he was never that good at football player. I don't know whether he did, truly. Uh, but if you think about that, to try and get representation in a case where you have so much more exposure, that can become very, very difficult. So normally what would happen is the insurance carrier would have defended, and I'm, that's, I'm kind of surprised they didn't even defend him, and on, under what we call a reservation of rights. We'll defend until the facts are further established. But if in essence, if they find that they, what you did was an intentional act, you know, you drive, you run over some, you run over Kelly with your car because you don't like her. I mean, a criminal act. They may defend the civil suit for a bit, but if it's determined that that was an intentional criminal act, the likelihood is that that policy 
is not going to cover any damages to Kelly or cover you for that judgment because it's an intentional act. Um, and, and so there are exclusions under the policy and that happens as well. But hope, you hope that they will at least defend the claim. And 176D um, keeps them honest about that whole process. Um, so that's just a couple of examples of where we would be using our skills in coordination with the uh, insurance carriers. Uh, let's talk about, I mean, I think what kicked Timson to death, um, Branley versus uh, U.S. Fidelity and Guarantee. Um, and this is a 176D claim, because this is, the, this is the, that illustration uh, that I was talking about. So the insurance carrier really has not uh, complied with the statutory uh, requirements of uh, fidelity to their insured because they've now exposed their client to an over the policy judgment. The one I talked to you about with my brother's case where they never even came close to offering the million and now the client is exposed to a million and a half dollar judgment. Um, and if there weren't other policies that would mean the individual likely would lose most of what they have. Uh, that happens to be a company, but no company wants to be exposed to a half a million dollars where it didn't need to be either. What, and this is an interesting case because it's an example of, this, of where they have then, the, the wrong person tries to sue the insurance carrier uh, because they failed to honor 176D. What's unusual, and we'll talk about the failure specifically in a minute, but what's unusual about this case is it's almost always brought by the insured, by the person who has the contract with the insurance carrier. And instead, in this case, it's brought by the injured party against the insurance carrier. And what makes it interesting is they have no privity of contract. Right? They, this, the insurance comp carrier, as a general matter, the argument is, has no obligation to third parties necessarily, but we're going to we're going to see that in, in a minute as well that they that they may. Uh, but more often than not, that is with the uh, individual themselves. Uh, and so, uh, this is an interesting case on two other fronts, at least for me. Maybe not as much for you. Um, I tried cases early on, a lot of cases early on, with the lawyer who represents uh, the plaintiff here, Hans Haley. Um, and uh, he's a very clever lawyer, uh, very skilled. And I also had a mediation one time with Judge Mazzoni. Uh, and like everything else, there's a million stories uh, with everything. But uh, let, let me first ask about Hans, because some of his behavior um, it seems to be questioned, uh, at least in some ways here. Um, Haley sends this uh, 93A 176D letter and says that they have failed to acknowledge and act reasonably promptly upon communications with respect to claims arising under insurance policies. They have failed to effectuate prompt, fair, and equitable settlements of claims in which liability has become reasonably clear. And they have forced, and this is as it says here, insureds to instigate litigation to recover amounts due under an insurance policy by offering substantially less than the amounts ultimately recovered. Um, and he, his argument is, well, this violates um, 93A and 176D. Um, what was his initial demand uh, for the damages that he says his client suffered in this case? One million four hundred thousand uh, was the initial demand. Um, and then it appears that the file got lost, he didn't do much of anything with it, uh, and also the insurance company didn't appear to do much of anything with it. Uh, and then uh, he made, so, so nothing happened initially, 
Um, then uh, there was another demand at some point for 900,000. Uh, those are pretty big numbers. How much did these cases ultimately uh, settle for? A little over 80,000. A little, a little over 80,000. So he makes a uh, million dollar demand that at least would appear to be incredibly unreasonable on the face of what they ultimately settled for. And no matter what, the insurance company has an obligation to respond to him to that demand he makes because that's the law. Astronauts has said vigorously. So you could ask me for 10 million, 20 million, whatever it is. It doesn't really make a difference. Even if it's patently unreasonable, 176D says that I owe you a response because that's the reasonable thing to do. Um, he doesn't have to be reasonable. He doesn't have to be reasonable. He, in fact, he, he doesn't he say that? I mean, because I, 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 I know this guy well. We both used to represent teachers in Boston. So uh, my, off, my firm was the main provider. If any time we had a conflict, he got the other, he got the other side. So, um, so we had a lot of cases together. And I, I could see him saying this is that, and this is what he said, and I, I'm looking for the language now. He says words to the effect of, well, 93A regulates, and 176, no, 176D regulates the insurance company and requires them to be reasonable. It doesn't require me to be, so I don't have to be, in essence. I mean, is he right? First of all, is he right? He is right. He <laughs> is right, isn't he? <laughs> isn't he? You should negotiate in good faith. But it's not a requirement. Not, not for him. It's a requirement for the, for the insurance, insurance carrier, carrier Correct. but it's not for you as the lawyer. Correct. That's almost shocking that you could make such an argument with a straight face, you lawyers, no? No. No, no. <laughs> it's not. And, it's, and let me tell you, I like him a lot, but it's certainly not, for him, not in my experience with him at all. At all. I'll tell you a couple quick ones, not to, not to rehash old war stories. Hans uh, was very skilled. Hans also uh, was in a wheelchair. The, the, uh, forever I knew him. That's how he, he got around in a wheelchair. Um, but if you thought he was disabled because he was in that wheelchair, man, you were going to be taken to school. Uh, because it might as well have been an extra tool he had in his arsenal, you know? That, Mike, can you carry these for me? I, I'll meet you downstairs in 210. The, hearing wasn't in 210, it was in 220, and I'm sitting around in 210 holding his shit, and he's never coming. Uh, it's, it, no, no, it's just, listen, it, it, one or two times you get school, do you say, okay, this is the way it's going to be. And, and maybe some of it wasn't intentional, a lot of it was, but I was, a very, I was very young, and he was a much more experienced lawyer. He would be able to tell me, straight face, firm, with, with no hesitation in his mind, Mike, that case doesn't say that. Okay, now, I read the case half a dozen times. It says precisely what I believe it says. And I would say, Hans, have you looked at this case? And he would say, yeah. It's, <laughs> whether he had or not, I'm sure. Yeah. And I said, the case says you're wrong. It, it says you lose. And he'd say, no, Mike. It says, it, it, honestly, God, it would say, he would say, it says just the opposite. And I guess what I'm telling you, to, the reason I'm telling you this because I really, I enjoyed our exchanges over the years, okay? But I guess what I'm telling you is even with someone who you like and have a, a good relationship with, honest to God, I would think that that would be correctly categorized as that, because I still see him at AJ competitions and stuff, and we're very friendly. Um, I guess I'm telling you that you have to be, you have to recognize that as the new lawyers, us old lawyers are going to try and take advantage of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it is, right? And I've I want you. Huh? I've seen that firsthand. That's, and, and, I'm t and no one could execute it better than he. 
And, and you know, at first, the first couple times you, you get burned, okay, if you keep getting burned, then you're just a moron, okay? You deserve it. But, that's right, you deserve it. But he's not going to stop trying as a general matter, and probably, boys will be boys, and there's probably not a lot of others out there. I'll, I'll tell you one last one, with, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you two last ones with him, just, just, to, make, just to make the point. Um, so we tried this case, a divorce case, bad, wicked, horrible divorce case, horrible, horrible, horrible. There's more stories that go with that, but I won't. Um, <laughs> just horrible. We, we settled it after about three days of trying it, and we have to write out the agreement. Okay, now remember, I told you he's got a wheelchair, so he's got the, the uh, you know, the, the, finger, hand, the gloves with no hands, right. uh, no fingers, so yeah. that he can do the wheelchair. And so he said, and, he, this, and seriously, honest to God, there's not much wrong with him on a regular basis. Right? It's, it's the weapon, okay? I told you this. So he says, my, now, have any of you ever seen my handwriting? Yeah. It's messy. Okay, it's, it's, it's horrible, yes. okay? It's horrible. Yes. So, so it's, I don't know, 3.30, whatever, it's late in the day. Says, and, and this is a fairly complicated, messy mess anyway. He said, Mike, uh, why, don't, why don't you write out the agreement? And right out. We didn't have laptops then. We write out. And the first, uh, everything that goes through my mind is this SOB. Now he's going to do it. He's going to try and do it again because obviously any ambiguities, any problems with this agreement that are, uh, are construed against my client because I'm the writer. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, oh, so now this, I'm gonna, we're going to have to be here till about 9 o'clock tonight because I've got to be incredibly careful. And what I'm telling you is you then have to be incredibly careful, right? This is, it, it, we tend to, it, it, you have to start to have your antenna up and work to uh, practice law defensively. This, to, to, and and it, it's, of course, what makes people not like us sometimes because we're always thinking doom and gloom is around the corner. But with a lot of people, it, doom and gloom is around the corner. And so we had to take extra pains to make sure it said what we said. And, you know, if they, you know, to try and even think about putting language in there, like, uh, you know, it's the intent of the parties to do X, Y, or Z, and to the extent we have to execute additional documents later on to carry that out, because, because I figure if I don't have a phrase like that with someone like this, I say no, the agreement doesn't say we have to execute anything else. So it's just it makes you think. It's it's not it's not a bad thing at the end of the day, but it just makes you recognize that you can't trust much. And that, as a lawyer, you've got to take pains to dot your I's and cross your T's. Um, and um, it's the way it is. I'll give you the one last one, just so you can sort of put in perspective. And, and I, don't, I hope I'm not making him sound terrible. I think part of it is he just has sort of an impish uh, sense of humor. Um, probably must be, must be about five years ago now. Uh, we're at the AAJ competition. He's one of the judges. Uh, Lisa, who's about Rachel's size, uh, is trying the case, and uh, she puts the easel up, and uh, she specifically turns, now the judges, the judges are here, she sees at the end, because he's in the wheelchair, she specifically turns to him and says, and, and now, frankly, you're not really supposed to have direct communication with jurors anyway. That, that could, but she, she was confident enough um, and, 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 and gutsy, that she said, can you see it? And she specifically turned to him and she said, can you see it where it is? So it's sort of like this. It's, it's not a good angle, but the, the angles in the courtroom aren't good anyway. But she turns to him which and says, can you see that? Okay. He says, yeah. That's what he says. Okay. We finished the trial. We, we've done with the case. He was kind to us in the judging, so I'm not using it as a, 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 a I'm not saying that at all, because he was, he was. But he says to her, and I'm thinking, okay, so this is why I'm going to tell him. He says, he, says, he, they, he says to her, you really shouldn't have put that easel there. He said, we had trouble seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is like 15 years ago. <laughs> go out of your way to try and make sure that it's not a problem because I can move it. And he specifically does what he did to me uh, on too many occasions, you know, trying to make you look or feel bad for something that clearly you had thought about. But and so I told Lisa that, and, and those guys that story, and I don't know what to make of that, by the way, because other than that, that even still, no matter what, you, know, you I guess you have to keep it on the high road even where there are those that are taking it to a slightly different level. And so 
Uh, that's my uh, story of the plaintiff's lawyer here, who, who, who is a good guy, but just a little off. <laughs> but, but in our profession, being just a little off is probably just pretty right. routine, if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right? So, so, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so let's, finish, let's, finish, let's finish this case. Um, so he doesn't have any obligation under 176D to be reasonable. And he wasn't. Because he ended up settling for less than 10 cents on the buck. But he still can sue and recover under 176D simply because they didn't respond to his demand. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. That's what the case says. And it says here, the plaintiffs are not entirely blameless. The, their attorney assisted in creating this situation by demanding an excessively large settlement. Plaintiff's counsel stated his deposition that because the carrier is regulated by the general laws and plaintiff is not, there's no problem with doing that way. <laughs> Go ahead. He's crazy. He, he's not, but he, in fact, he's correct here, yeah. right? It, it's not the greatest lawyer in the world, but he wins. Because the insurance company is not going to give you the amount that you want. Oh, so, oh, so that's OK, too, then. So you, gotta, you just demand pie in the sky. There is, They're not. They're going to give you so you might as well, tiddlywinks. So you might as well be incredibly unreasonable when you make your demands. Might as well. you, you I can always come down, I can't go up. That can, that's right. Sure. That can be a so, tactic. You know, you can so use that's that. your plan. And, and what yeah. they did I got was. got a $5,000 fender bender, I'm asking for half a million. <laughs> no, that's not reasonable. That's not reasonable. That's too much. I thought you just were telling me you're not going to be reasonable because that's the dance. They're going to offer I, you that a $5,000 thing. They're going to offer you about $200. And you're going to look at them and be like, you what? It's a low ball offer. So, so when you guys make your first demand, tell me what it is. What is it? Going big or going home. So what, but what does that mean? Maybe three times more than five. Three times more. So yeah, if you want five, maybe. you're going to ask for 15. Yeah, that's OK. Give me, give me a counter offer. <laughs> Counter offer to what? Fifteen or what? I mean, I just or do we listen? Then we have to do this. Start incredibly, almost ridiculously high. I can always come down. Or, or I can't tell you what I really want. Is that is that what? You're, let's start from here. I cannot tell you what I really want because then you're still going to try and whittle me down from there. That's right. Is, it, that's, is that true? Yes. So that's, that's how insurance companies make their money. So I'm going to start with a ridiculous, outrageous beginning and see what sticks. Is, is, is that true? Yeah. I like Hans. So on a claim, yeah. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> that's what it was effective here. You don't think there's something improper about that? Is that you got a case that, I assume since you settled it, you thought that that must be a reasonable value. But you demanded 10 times that. That's great. I don't feel bad for insurance. Me either. I don't feel bad for them either. I'm wondering, is this, so that is the acceptable method of negotiation. Ask for 10 times what you want, and, I can, and I'll just come down. No, but it's a tactic, and that's what he used to get them to be unresponsive. I'm wondering what your tactics are going well, to be. At least, I would say at least do it at least five more than what the client wants, because yeah. they're not going to give So if you want 10, time. if you really, if 10 is your bottom line, you're going to ask for yeah, 50. Ask time. What? <laughs> I'm yes, going to ask for 20. I'm going, yes. I'm going to ask for 20. That's oh, the 20 might not get you 10. 20, no. I'm thinking you'll take three. I'd go higher than that. <laughs> no, really, I think I'm using this math. If I want 10, I'm going to go 50. Five times. Five times. Yeah. yeah. Five so, times. Uh, so as a defendant, I should just assume that whatever your demand is, it's not realistic. And divide at the minimum by five, I think I'm going to divide by 10. Uh, right? As a defendant, then I know. This is the, your plaintiff's dance. So you want to dance? I, okay. So I'll. So when you are ask for fifty, I'll say you got a thousand. So be thankful I'm giving it to you. Why don't you we can take it to court. Yeah. Okay. Right. So that's it. Our discussions are over because that doesn't make for a very no, long. Look at rewards that the courts have given for similar cases. Okay, but so so yeah, look at the one. <laughs> that's what I want to know, Pat. You do your analysis, you look at it, the number pretty much looks like for this broken ankle, 75 grand. That's what the jury verdicts have been for people of similar age and everything else. 
and with the similar meds and all the rest of it, and that's what I want to know. So your number now is what? When you double it? Just double? 120. That's a jury award, right? 75 is what you see as the value. But you so your demand is 125. But but aren't there a lot of people out there like Hans? Because because if I'm the insurance carrier, if I'm thinking you this is what you all do, and you only ask for 125, I'm figuring it's a 10 to 15 thousand dollar case. Right? right? That's that's what I'm looking at here. So I right you understand the question. I'm asking if I'm the defendant now, right? Because this is what I have to try and think about if I want to resolve it. I want to think about what's their mindset. And so what does their mindset get us to the point of where we can actually engage in a dialogue? If they're thinking everything is divisible by 10, then asking for 125 puts them in a frame of mind that this case is worth 12. 50, and you told me you wanted 75. So I'm just wondering. See, I think he's way high. I'm, I'm probably closer to your school of thought, right? I think you gotta be high with enough room that I can make you think that you've whittled me down, save a little for you, and then hopefully still be above my bottom line by the time we're done. Because I think if you do get piggish, then there's no, there's no dialogue here. So, yeah. so I'm probably closer to your school of thought clearly than Hans, but how does that get us to when the other side is sitting there thinking, oh, these folks, these, everyone does this. And so when they give me a number, it has nothing to do with reality. Or do I just say, listen, I want, I want 175. There's a little room there for negotiation, but that's a real number. Here's how I got there. But my real number is buck and a quarter, buck. My real bottom line. Because I'm never going to tell you my bottom line, am I? Not, not, no, not no, unless no, we're no. way down that road. No. I mean, not unless we're at the 11th hour and it's a question of, you know, we're, we're, we're this close. I probably still won't tell you, right? No, that's right. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you a number, but it isn't the right number. So, so we lie. Is that, that's the deal? We lie during Ultimately, the Ultimately, yes. Some Ultimately or, 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 constant, or constantly? It's not lying. But you're not telling the truth, right? What I really well, want is the 175. So yeah, I do really want the 175. I absolutely do. But I'm telling you, this is this is what my demand is. Okay, okay. What's your real number? What? <laughs> 174. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what they offer back, and just kind of go back and forth. But so is that what it is? So is that why I have to start so high? I think so. I mean, you, if you try to sit back and wait on them to offer a number, you're going to get disappointed. Okay? Because it's not going to be anywhere in the ballpark of what you were thinking, what you were looking at, or what you want. So this whole initial demand and initial negotiation has nothing to do with reality. Is that right? Because no wonder cases don't get settled early then, no? If everyone talks about fantasy numbers, both on the high and the low side, no wonder you people don't resolve anything. You don't tell me what you want. I mean, you tell me, you tell me what you dream of, but you don't really tell me what it's going to take to resolve this. No, no, that, that's a problem, isn't it? If we were going to engage in a real dialogue to resolve a problem, we would sort of put on the table at some point what our plans are for resolution of that problem. You lawyers don't appear to do that. What I want. Tell me what you'd take. Tell me what you'd take to make this go away. Huh? An A. <laughs> <laughs> but see, now I know you're so high that I see plus I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. So, so we're resolved. Um, no, but don't you see? Seriously, though, all kidding aside, don't you? This has to be a problem that you you must have to start to think about when we negotiate. If we're doing civil cases, because usually it's almost always about the money. So, what is it that? How do we engage in that? Because I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the last story about this case. Um, because this 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 is what this is what this is what 
aggravates me and worries me sometimes. But I've so I've solved it myself now. But I'm going to tell you the story because you're not going because because it's it's about Judge Brizzoni, okay? So so suppose we're honest about it, right? Look, this is the number, okay? Um, and of course, that's a little high, but I mean, so now we're at a number, we'll just say 700 grand. 675, that's probably about it. There's maybe a little bit of wiggle room left, but I'm telling you the number 700, that's the bottom line. In this case, we'll go to trial otherwise, right? That's it. Mm -hmm. So, but we don't settle it that day. So now, is that the starting point for the next negotiation? So now I just move you down from seven? Because this is the problem. The, the phrase we use is, well, I'm just negotiating against myself now. But I was honest. I was open. I told you what the number is. And now, that's it. And there's no, there's no further floor. So I got to make it, I got to make it, I got to give you an incentive to resolve the suit today with my number, right? So how about this? It's, and that number goes up 50 grand a week for every week from here to trial. So next week the number is 750. The week after that is eight, the week after that is 850, the week after that we go to trial. Because really, right, if you think about it, in the last four weeks I'm gonna have to put a lot more work into this case that requires a lot more effort and a lot more labor. And so consequently uh, the case will get, I will put in more work, but the case will get stronger and someone ought to pay, for, for not just for aggravating me like that, but for having to do this. Can I do that? I'll, I'll tell you where the, the, uh, the impetus came from that. Um, I heard a story early on that Harold Cohn, an antitrust lawyer in uh, Philadelphia, had four defendants, and what he said is, he put it out to all four. He said, million dollars, Friday after, by Friday at five o'clock, and you can be out but it's Friday at five o'clock, it's a million dollars, okay? Lawyer shows up Monday morning, 10 a.m., with the check for a million dollars. Sorry. <laughs> Harold says, I asked about this story because it almost sounded too callous to believe. The guy shows up Monday morning, 10 a.m., million dollars. Gives it to Harold, says, I guess we're done, Harold. Pushes it back. Harold's this old school Philadelphia lawyer, straw hat, you know, all of that. Pushes the money back. He says no. He says the number today is two million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh come on! I'll tell you. I asked him about the story because it, you know, it becomes legend pretty quickly. Um, and he said, "I said, is that really true?" And he said, "It was." Uh, and he said, "And it's even worse than people talk about." He said, "He said because the lawyer who shows up Monday morning, he said, he starts crying. He said, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a grown man. As the expression goes." <laughs> And he starts crying. He says, uh, I, I pushed my client to do this. There really isn't any more money that we can get. You have to do this, the client. Um, I, don't, I don't know what I'll do, Harold, if you don't take it. And, and he gives him the check back, and he sends him out. Um, and I said, really? Uh, and he said, yes. He said, but let me, let me explain. So I'll explain to you why in that situation it's more appropriate. He said, I had four defendants. He said, the way I've always structured it is the first one gets out relatively cheap because they're going to finance the cost of the litigation. And then after that, I only have three more defendants left. So each one has to pay consecutively more, and the last one, obviously, is going to be the one left holding the bag. He said, someone else came in with the check on, on Friday with the million dollars, and they were out. I can't let another defendant get out for the same because that's just not the way I work it. The next one, the price of poker has to go up, and it did. And he said, and I gave him his check back. Um, so, so he said that's what he did, and, and frankly, he's an incredibly successful lawyer over the long haul. So you, you've got to give them an incentive to do it. Price goes up. Price goes up. I was going to ask that. You can pit all the defendants against each other to get. That's precisely what he did. He said, one of you is getting out today, at the end of the week, for a million dollars. Who's it going to be? And that is the way when multiple multi-party litigations, that's what you want, because whoever's going to be left at the end is going to hold the bet. Um, and I just want to give you the last story on the, this, this, the ADR part of it. So we're, we're relatively close on this case. And Judge Mazzone, who now is retired, is the um, uh, mediator. And he was a nice guy. 
but he was huge. He's like 6'10". He's an old hockey player. Uh, and in the black robe, he looked even bigger. Uh, and so we were there for most of the day trying to settle this case. And then um, at some point, the, the client obviously relies on you guys to tell him what the strength, the, le the strength of their case is and what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. At the end of the day, it is their decision. But you advise them as to what you think they should be able to do at trial from a standpoint of liability. And I mean, damages are harder to estimate, but a lot of times you can have a reasonable handle on it. Um, and the other side was stalling. We had a very, very strong case. The numbers were getting closer to that 700, we said, but, but not where they needed to be yet. Uh, and it, it may have been relatively small money from the 700, but the 700 was the number. Um, and, and actually now it was supposed to be 750 because we're a week later. Um, and he takes me in the back and he, said, he leans over the desk, I'm sitting down, he's standing up, and he's 6'10". I'm not a small guy, but if you're 6'10", uh, you look really big when you're leaning over. And he's, of course, he's a judge, and he's boom, his voice is booming, he said. And I'll never forget it. He says, you know, he points his finger, and he says, you are the only thing between this case and a settlement. And he says, and I want you to go out there right now, and you tell your client to take this deal. Just like that. Were you intimidated? Huh? No. I, I mean, listen, could you have been intimidated? Yes. Uh, you know, listen. I, used to, I said to people at other times in other cases, you know, I shouldn't say that. Um, I not, ever have a tooth knocked out in a fight? Okay. What's the worst that can happen that a judge can do to you? Right? Can yell at you, Bark. right? You ever have your ass kicked in a fight? Do go that route, okay? There's a lot worse things that can happen to you than a judge yell at you. And for the money we get, simply to have someone yell at you and I'm supposed to feel bad, my job is precisely to protect him against abuses like that. And I don't really care that you don't like me serving the role that I went to school for and that I'm supposed to do. And I'm not going to, you're not going to sell him out. And this, this is why I think it's important. He, I don't think you see much of this these days, but this wasn't that long ago that, that the, the judge will try to bully you to settle the case. But you can't, that's, you can't let that happen, right? You can't let that happen. Your job is to insist on exercising your client's rights. And I do think some of the more old school, and you see it every now and then, because here's what, here's what the court is worried about. This case probably, this case I think we had scheduled for an uh, eight, nine day trial. That's a lot of time for the court to, to consume of their docket. They don't like that often. And so they're going to try and push you and persuade you and your client to not exercise your constitutional rights. That's just, you can't do that, right? You can't allow that to happen. That's precisely why, you, why hopefully you went to law school and hopefully you've got a thick skin. And so, said, no, I can't do that. I said, when the number is right, when they where they're supposed to be, that I will recommend to him to do what, what I think it is. But, it, but, but they're not there yet, and they understand what their obligation is. Um, and frankly, I had no, you know, you, always, you should always worry taking a case to trial. I had little worries that we could successfully win that case based on what we had uncovered during discovery, and that the damages could be well in excess of the number we were asking. So I mean, the, the, their risk was, I think, significantly greater than ours. As long as you make that assessment, and as long as the client understands that risk, because that's the other part of it is, you know, seven, uh, what, say, say 650 sounds a lot better after you've got a verdict of zero and there's no money coming in <laughs> than when um, you have it sitting in your pocket and later on you say, so you really think I could have got a million to see? Yeah, I think it was that type of case. Um, so, so that's your job. So, th I, this case, this I like doing this case because I think there's a bunch of lessons there, uh, and I also think it starts for you to start to think about what this means about your own negotiating strategy, um, because I think you do lose some credibility if you're really making demands that are uh, realistically uh, ten times the reasonable value. And I think that contributed to the insurance company saying, oh, you know, forget this, we're not going to respond at all. The problem is they can't do that. 
Uh, they can reject the settlement offer. Uh, they can say no. They can say, make us a, make us a, a more realistic offer and we can <laughs> entertain it. Uh, but what they can't just do is ignore it. Um, and, and so that becomes important uh, to 176D. The last thing that I think is interesting about this case is the last piece that's in here. Uh, and what it says is that the matter came before, back before the court on the motion of the defendant for reconsideration. They reported the matter settled, and they then filed a stipulation of dismissal with prejudice. What was happening here, and I'll bet the insurance company paid a premium, they didn't want this precedent to stand. They didn't want this precedent that others could use 176D other than the party in privity uh, under the contract. And so the likelihood is they paid a premium to be able to go back in, get an agreement to set aside that judgment, and then simply file a stipulation of dismissal. Because the last time I looked, this was one of the few cases I could find where someone other than the insured used 176D against uh, the insurance carrier. Usually what happens is you get the insured's assignment of these rights and then you can pursue it uh, in essence on behalf of the insured but the only reason you're allowing them to do that is they likely don't have the assets to satisfy the excess judgment um, and so therefore what you're trying to do is get the carrier to pay for, for those sins. Uh, it's an interesting case, and I think there's a bunch of different points that, that are worth thinking about. We've got one more to do, and then we'll get you out of here. Fellheimer, Eichen, Braverman, and Karski. Uh, the law firm files, and this is unusual, an emergency TRO precluding the former employee and the former employee's in, in, employer's insurance carrier from settling the claims of discrimination. Normally, the insured, as I told you with my own story at the outset, is dying for the insurance company to pony up their money and free me from any further exposure under the litigation. Here, uh, the lawyer is uh, upset that the insurance company is settling the, se the sexual harassment claim and wants to uh, prevent them from resolving it and the insurance carrier is saying, well, what the heck? We, we want to settle this claim. There's exposure here. There's more exposure under the policy. We think she's got a pretty good claim. Um, but he wants... Uh, he wants a retraction out. He wants a retraction. He wants an apology, uh, in essence, that these claims are ill-founded uh, before he agrees to let them settle. Right? Uh, well, what, that's my first question. Um, 200 grand, that's pretty good money, right? So why doesn't she just say, why don't you as the lawyer just have your client lie? Um, take the 200 grand. Let's make it 300, because that's, that's more easily divisible by three for you. 300 grand. All I want for your 100,000 is for you to encourage your client to say the claims uh, were not meritorious, and I'm sorry, Mr. Sexual Harasser. Know what? Know what? I've given you exactly the number you want. The number you couldn't get any more likely if you went to trial. 300 grand. You know what? I'll give you a little premium. 330. All I want is the apology for putting me through this. And, ta and tarnishing my record. And tarnishing my reputation, yes. So what do you say? Client says, well, what do you think I should do? Rachel Sandy Sunshine. Take the money. Take the money <laughs> and apologize. No. I really need the money. I will tell my client what they offered because that's my duty. And then it's up to her. If she feels well, what would you do, Sunshine? That's a client. That's a client asking. Really what would you do? If it really happened to me, it did. I would say no. Don't take it? I Can we get more if we go to trial? I don't know that if we would get more, but I'm not going to bow down when you actually cause this. I didn't tell well, you. Well, you don't have to bow down. I'm the one that has to. But you're asking me to say that what I said wasn't true. To no, say that's me. No, no, that's, uh, that's me. I'm, you're the lawyer. I'm just wondering what your advice is. I'll say, listen, I don't care. I just like to be How done. strongly do you feel about what happened to you? It's terrible. I think about uh, what he did to me constantly. You do? Can you sleep? 
Um, not always. Can you sleep better with 330,000? Can I sleep better? <laughs> <laughs> 220 after your cut. How are you um, feel after you retract what you said about them? Well, I'll be honest with you. You know, we don't have money to pay the mortgage the next three months. Well, it's ultimately your decision. I would, you know. Well, would you do it? You should know. <laughs> She's like, yes. Would you, would you, would you do it? Listen, this, this is what they ask sometimes, okay? Well, would you take it? Would you do it? So that's why I'm asking you. Would you? Like, do we tell them? Do you tell them what you would do? Because that's what they want to know. Do, would you take it? Would you do it? This is the question. And, uh, and so what is the answer? Well, it doesn't really matter what I would do. OK, it's what we do. I know, I know, I know. But I need to know what you would do. Because we've been in this together now. Would you do it? Well, I guess I'm trying to find out how important it is. And if it's not that important for her to retract her statement, then take it. But there's so it's just a, So it's just a lie. All we're doing is lying a little bit to get the cash. What's the big deal after all? Exactly. Is there any way to make that so that it doesn't become public record? Like, this oh, so we'll lie privately, oh, but I don't want everyone to know. Even better. Well, can, I don't know if you intend the news to come out and say, oh, she's a, she falsely accuses a person. And oh, but can't we always? I mean, so we can even dress this up anyway. Listen, all I'm prepared to say is that the, part, the case was settled to uh, our satisfaction. And we're sorry. Well, let me ask you that. Am I am I just being a measly lawyer? We're lawyers, right? We use words. We must be able to find words that we can all live with. Yeah. Aren't we? <laughs> all right. I'm sorry you sexually harassed me. Can I have my money? Well, you're not going to get it for that. <laughs> you're not going to get it for that. How about language like uh, the uh, plaintiff recognized that the likelihood of success at trial is was not strong. Can you live with that? The, the likelihood of plaintiff, proving plaintiff's claims at trial was dubious. <laughs> What's that? We need a thesaurus. You got a better word, we've got a, a softer word for dubious. Is this what we do? No, seriously, we just have to work out the language that we can agree on? <laughs> right? <laughs> is that what it is? Because it must be language. She won't say she's sorry. But maybe she'll say she's sorry for that, that the matter had to get to this point. What about that? I'm sorry that your reputation is on the line. How about that? I'm sorry that your reputation has been damaged as a result of this. And she'll no. just leave off when you deserve it, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> right about that. I'm sorry that your, oh, how about that? Can we live with that? I'm sorry that your reputation has been damaged as a result of this. It's not, it's not a lie. It's, we're just leaving off the other part that, but you deserve everything you get. So what, what do you think? That's, well, because we'll have to craft this statement. This lawyer obviously wants a statement to be able to be released. The plaintiff said she was sorry that the defendant's reputation was damaged as a result of this. I, I, you know what? That's good by me. I mean, I can live, I'm, I'm the defendant. It, that, and, and the rest of the provision says, and beyond this, all the parties can say is that the matter has been resolved to their mutual satisfaction. I like it. Sounds good. I like it. Sounds good. Sounds so, good. So, so we're just going to make believe and make it sound to the whole world that she's a, she was lying. It's clever. Clever. So, oh, so that's clever. That's not deceitful. You, uh, that's okay. I, I've had to work on these before. That's why I just want to make sure that, 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 that that's, is that, would you, so would you tell her? Would you tell her, you can sign this. I mean, as long as you feel good about it, you can sign it. Oh, you don't need to feel good. Listen, you want the 220 grand? Right, right. Yeah, right. You want the 220, can you say that? The plaintiff said that she's sorry, the plaintiff, the defendant's reputation was injured as a result of this. And beyond that, the case has been resolved to the party's mutual satisfaction. In this case, a plaintiff's attorney would definitely do that because he was negotiating simultaneously with the insurance company as well as right. the defendants. Well, do you think he, so would you, would she, you think, would you recommend that to your client? Does the rest of it matter? I guess maybe that's what I'm wondering. Does the rest of it really matter? It's really about the money, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I can dress it up with other things. Oh, we want these things too. But if the number's not right, or if the number's even more than right, I don't really care about that. Is, is that what it is? 
The other things are sort of distractors. Oh, apologies, and, you know, remedial measures, and oh, you'll do a new training policy and all this, but the, the, the <laughs> bottom line is that number better get high. Is that, that, so that's, is what, that is what it is? It's not about the rest of it, because, it, no? It's about the money. Wouldn't you like the bastard to have some type of uh, sexual harassment training seminar, awareness seminar? He won't learn. Yeah. He's going to do it again. <laughs> He's not going to learn anything. He wants to. But, but okay, oh, so wait a minute, wait a minute, that, so <laughs> he won't learn anything, so it's no sense asking. You can suggest it. Well, what do you mean suggest it? I want to know, is that, is, is that part of your settlement provision, or is it just, no, it's about numbers. It's really just the number. Well, oh, would you like him as part of an agreement to do this, that that's what he must do? He must go to some type of sexual harassment, awareness, seminar offered by any one of these three places. Women's Resource Center, Ginny Geiger Crisis Center, or yeah, whoever. I mean, I like that. Or the Batteries Program, right? I mean, that's what we, a lot of times, in criminal cases, we will send the spouse to a Batteries Program as part of the condition of uh, probation or release. So, so would you ask for those types of things in civil suits? Get you less money. Yeah, I mean, you oh, so wait, 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 go ahead, I'm coming over. Okay, so it could cost you a few grand, and God knows we wouldn't want to do that. Is that what you would just, is, is that your, what your point is, was? <laughs> go ahead, Pat. I mean, you asked for, apart from the money, we settled on the money thing. He wants the apology for sexual, he wants you to apologize to him, or whatever that is. Obviously, he's not taking the rap for it. But now you want to take, have him take responsibility by going to the class? I don't even I don't see how those two <laughs> requirements would jive. I agree. So maybe you present it and then they all get one. I, I guess this is as an alternative, I'm wondering, uh, because it sounds like you all are going to have her sign that statement that is incredibly misleading. <laughs> so if she's going to sign the statement, you go to the class. Well, I'm not going to the class, but we're going to sign the statement, so we just settle on the money. Okay, but, but <laughs> no, no, let's, I, this is a separate issue now, I think, really. Oh. So you're going to have her sign a statement that's terribly misleading. Okay. No one, no one's doing otherwise. Because that line, that line, because the number's right. Sunshine. I'm finding it hard not to talk because I know when I say something, you're going to twist it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just exploring the other alternatives. Okay. While you're thinking about that. So do you care what you leave behind when you settle some of these? That's, that's the second yes. half of this. Yes. Oh, no, you say, you give me the face and you say yes, okay? <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, but of course. <laughs> yeah, but that 110 is going to make its way to your bag pretty quick, Sam. I um, you, if it's going to be one of those clients that doesn't die and you know that she's going to come back and say, well, I'm not happy with this, that's why you do have to make sure that she's not going to call you all hours of the day. So you want to make sure that what you leave behind, you did well. So I would ask her, is it important to you to retract that statement? If it's not that important and you want to move on in your life, then I would do the statement. But if it is important to her and she feels strongly against the employer, then I would advise her not to because she feels strongly and he's just going to do it again. So um, if she doesn't feel strongly against lying, you'll just help her with it. <laughs> no, right? Are, 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 we, are we saying, no, it's not a lie, <laughs> it's just not complete? It's not a whole truth. It's not, it's not the whole truth. <laughs> it's vague. It, yeah. It's, it's really vague. vague. It's Is that language vague. really vague? You came up with it. I think you did an awesome job. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I'm wondering. Uh, listen, we ha I had a case one time. The numbers were fine. And the defendant said precisely this. No, he's going to apologize. I'm thinking, there's no way in the whole wide world he's going to apologize. OK, but we can see if we can find language that you might be able to live with. Uh, but it's just, just not going to happen, I, the way this case went. Not, not happening ever. And it didn't need to be, frankly. He did nothing to apologize for. The evidence was incredibly clear. That was precisely what the plaintiff said. But the defendant saying, not going to be any money. And we were on the money. But he said, that, you know, they throw it in at the end. So I mean, is it just, so it's just working out the language. Do you feel like, though, you're assisting with uh, the client lying? Which, by the way, I guess it's not a problem if they want to, right? Yeah, it's up to her. She wants the money. But you, but you are facilitating that. 
I mean, I guess what you could say is, no, I can't do this. I resign. I withdraw. I am, and, I, and I feel so strongly about it, I am not taking <laughs> any fee out of this case. <laughs> that's not going to happen. How's that? That's not going to happen. So, so you're in it till the end. <laughs> the only question is, how do we, how do we make this work? That's okay. And listen, I didn't get out. I found language we could all live with, but I, you know, and I get, you know, I'm not going to have them lie either. Your statement's pretty strong, though. Your statement, I think, is stronger than what I signed. I wonder if there might be a little backing off of that. But again, I think it, it was close, though, by the way. I'm sorry it had to come to this or something like that. So there's sorry in there, but it really doesn't, doesn't convey what, what he's sorry about. <laughs> or, or I forget, I should look at that language and see. It's not that far off, but I think it might have softened it a little. I might have done what you guys tell me you do anyway, is that I'm going further, but I'm not going further at first. I'll see if this language, which is far more milk toasty, is agreeable. Um, well, let, let, let's, let's do this case and let's get you out of here because we've talked about enough stuff that wasn't even in these cases already. Um, can the insurance carrier settle over his objection? Because if they settle over his objection, he'll never, I mean, it'll look like he did what it, well, frankly, if they're paying 200 grand. <laughs> because uh, the insurance company, everything up to now, we've talked about, they don't just open the vault. So if they're paying 200 grand, they must think these claims are more than substantiated and that at trial, they are likely to lose significantly more because this just wouldn't happen as a regular matter. Usually it's the insured pushing them to settle and here he doesn't want them to and they still want to settle over his objection and I think that's because they expect a judgment much larger than the amount that the plaintiff is willing to take if they can settle it. Um, can they settle over his objection? And if, if no, why no? So what's the answer? Can they settle over his objection? Yes or no? Yes, yes if no. they have absolute authority. Yes, if they, yes, if they have contract. absolute authority. No, if he's got something to lose. Yep. In this case, does he have something to lose? Right, he's got counterclaims asserted. And so this is the problem, and that doesn't always happen in a lot of cases either, but here he asserted counterclaims for her accusations. And so the fact is they cannot settle that case uh, and dispose of his counterclaims without his authorization. And under the terms of the policy, at least this policy, they did not have full authority to settle anyway. Every policy is different. So part of it depends on the wording of the policy. This is a, a very unusual situation because almost always they would want, the insurer would want to settle. But not always, because especially like this, depending on what you're accused of, it can make you look incredibly bad. For a lawyer, um, who was it? The case I read in the Globe, and I think it was a lawyer, and it was a partner that had done Oh, it was Nick's case. Defamation? Was it? I read it. I, I, I can pull it out. And I'll, I'll pull it out and get it for you because I'm trying to... What? Well, that would be a good one. Um, he made a demand upon the other... I think it was a lawyer. And in the demand for settlement, he alleged very... It appears very scandalous things about his personal life that, that at least he thought... That at least it was believed he wouldn't want anyone else to know about. Well, he was closeted. I forget what it was, but it was. I'll, I'll pull it for you. And in fact, what they they, they argued there is that, that that might even have been by the lawyer now, potential extortion. Uh, and so there are things within some of our lawsuits um, that in a, in, in a lawsuit is, as a general matter, public information. Uh, it's rare that you see those documents sealed. There was an article in yesterday's Globe about them sealing a case from Beverly here with the Landmark School uh, alleging sexual abuse. And the argument now is, is if those records hadn't been sealed for 15 years, we might not have other victims in the process. So as a general matter, uh, court documents are public, but what happens when they allege you know, scandalous things that could injure someone's reputation significantly? Um, and that was in, there was a case like that in federal court within the last year and a half about some very famous 
male public figure in Massachusetts who was attempting, to, who was who a prostitute, at least alleged, was attempting to extort, and they wanted to keep those documents sealed. So there are various instances where, uh, you know, even the filing of the lawsuit uh, can create significant public problems, uh, public perception problems for the individual accused, even though obviously until the civil suit is proved, until the criminal charges are proved, um, the, the filing of the claim doesn't prove anything. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, this is um, a mess of a situation, but the lawyer has the right to have his day in court, uh, and the insurance company, as much as they may like to, uh, cannot settle over his uh, objections, and uh, therefore he has the right uh, to prevent the settlement in this case, even if the insurance company feels it's in the best interest, and even if the plaintiff wants to, uh, because uh, the insured had a claim that they asserted by way of counterclaim, and the potential settlement uh, would uh, preclude uh, the plaintiff's rights in that regard. So, uh, again, oftentimes by the terms of the contract, but beyond that, uh, if the plaintiff has nothing to lose, the court, the, the insured may be able to settle over the, uh, the insurance company may be able to settle over the insured's objections, but absent uh, that, uh, they have to act with fidelity to their insured, and as the court said here, they didn't think that the insurance company was uh, faithful to their insured where he had the counterclaim filed. So, I'll see you next Tuesday.